Well, Happy New Year to you. How many are excited about being in God's house this morning? Last day of 2023 as we usher in 2024. Anybody here besides me believing for more in 24? Uh, just believing for God to do more than he's, than he's ever done. Next Sunday, we'll um, introduce our word of the year. And um, don't ask me what it is today because I will not tell you. All right, next Sunday morning, but we'll have our wristbands and we'll have the graphics and we'll have a message. And um, we're going to be ready to fire up this new year with a brand new, brand new word. But um, today is a really important day in the life of our church every year because on this last Sunday of the, of the, um, of the year, I always prepare us for this next season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And today is going to be no, no different. But um, I'm really, really excited about the message today and about what it's going to mean for all of us as we just get ready to enter into this, this brand, new, brand new season. Anybody besides me um, ha- just so happy that Christmas was awesome? Come on, anybody have a good Christmas? But anybody glad Christmas is over and ready to move, move on in? I mean, it was, it was fun, but it was busy and lots of stuff going on. I just, it's my favorite time of the year. I love it. But I was, I was, ready, to, um, I was, I was ready to move into a new season. And anybody, anybody just anticipating God to do really, really great things in this next year? Come on, if you, if you can't, listen, if you can't see it, you won't be it. You know what I mean? If you can't see a better year, you won't have a better year because better years never just happen. You know what I mean? We pray them in and we we press in and we do our part so that God can do his part. And I'm just believing for a really, really great, great 2024. Well, today I want to kick off this this, um, season of prayer and fasting that will begin tomorrow for our church and um, for those of you that are new, for the last 17 or 18 years, we have entered into the first 21 days or so of every year with a time of prayer and a time of fasting, and we have seen God do incredibly, incredibly great things, just so many wonderful things that, that God has done during, during this season of, of fasting and prayer. This year is going to be, going to be no different. We, we do it at the beginning of the year because God says when we seek first the kingdom of God, he says, then all these things. There's something about priorities. There's something about what you put first in your life. If, if my marriage is not first, then there will be other things that take precedent over my marriage and my marriage will, will feel like something that's not prioritized in my life. There's something powerful about priority. Priorities matter. What you put first matters. What you do first matters. Priority is, is significant. And, and every year we kick off the new year with a, with a time of giving God something, giving God our best, giving God our time, saying, God, we're going to set this time aside because this year you will be number one. You will be my top priority. You will be everything to me. I can't ask from you if I don't give to you. I can't expect from you if I'm not offering to you. And God, at the beginning of this year, I'm offering my very best to you. The best of who I am. The best of all I have. Here's why we, here's why we do that. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Come on, say it with me. Say first. First, number one, above everything else, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means what's right. Seek first God and then what's right. Come on, how many want to do what's right? How many want to be treated right this year? Well, then you got to do right this year because we reap what we sow. So God, as we seek first your righteousness, he says, then all these things, what things? What are the things he's speaking of? The promises of God, the declarations of his word for your life. When we prioritize, when we seek God, when we put God first, then all the promises from God's word. He says, then they will be added back unto us as well. We talk about fasting this time every year because the the benefits that fasting can produce in your life and my life are so limitless. The benefits that come from fasting. Number one, when you start to fast, you get more sensitive. You get sensitive to the voice of God. You begin to hear God's voice better. You get get more sensitive to the promptings of God in your heart. 
You begin to feel God moving. You begin to sense, wait, God's up to something. God's saying something. God's doing something. You become more sensitive. You become more sensitive to the, to the promptings of the, of the Holy Spirit. When you, when you fast, listen, when we fast, we, we don't manipulate God through fasting. Come on, how many know you can't manipulate God? We can't say, God, because I'm doing this, now you have to do that. That's called manipulation. And you can't manipulate God. Because how many know who in this relationship, there's only one God and it's not me. It, the, the creation cannot manipulate the creator. So fasting does not manipulate God, but watch this. Fasting does motivate God. How do you know that, Scott? Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that he, speaking of God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what fasting is. Fasting is saying, God, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to take my life, and it's going to be in pursuit of you. I'm going to put aside some of the things that my flesh craves, some of the things that my flesh is used to. I'm going to put, put aside some of the things that are normal in my life, and I am going to spend this season pursuing you so I can hear your voice, so I can draw closer to you, so I can hear your will, hear your plan, so I can gain strength from you. God, that's what I'm doing in this season. And you know what? Every year we hear, every year the stories, just this past week, um, typically the stories come in like, you know, in the, the month or two or three after the fast, I hear all these stories. But just this past week, I got a text message from a guy. He said, hey, pastor, I meant to send this to you earlier, but, but I forgot. And I know the fast is coming up. We're going to start next week. We're so excited. I wanted to tell you what God did last year as we fasted. He said, me and my family, we were fasting about this job promotion at, at work and, um, he said it was crazy. We didn't get the promotion that we were actually praying and fasting for. But what God did was gave me something even better than what I was asking him for. You know why? Because God does exceeding abundant above all we ever ask, think, or imagine. He said the other thing we were fasting for, our fasting. When we fast, you always fast with a cause. You never fast without a cause. David said this when he was talking about fast. He said, hey, is, is there not a cause? Is, not, is there not something in your life, your relationships with your spouse, with your kids, your health, your, your, your finances, your, your family, you know, these issues of bitterness or forgiveness that you want to leave in 2023 and you don't want to take them into 2024, some habits that you want to leave in the past and not push forward with you into the future, some things that are not making you better but they're holding you back and you want to just let go. Isn't there something, is there not a cause? Is there not something in your life Something in your dreams, something in your heart. We always fast with a cause. We have our list. Today, there's plenty of material out front. You can pick it up at the counters and on the tables on the way out. There's a, there's a, a fasting bookmark. There's some information about the fast that we'll be on. You take those bookmarks. You write those things down. You write the things that you're believing God for. Don't just enter into a fast blindly, but we enter into the fast saying, God, I'm giving you this time. Here's what I'm believing you for. Here's what I'm praying for. Here's what I'm asking you for, God. Here's what I'm fasting for. And watch God move. He said, not only did I get this big promotion, but he said, you know what, we're praying for a family member who had had miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and, and they really wanted a baby, and we just prayed, God, you know the desire of their heart. God, give them a baby. He said, this year during the fast, you know what they're doing? They're holding their little baby girl. Because God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I could sit here and spend the next 40 minutes talking about story after story after story. Miracle after miracle after miracle of the things that God has done. But today I want to talk about this. Some fasting facts. I want to just give you some facts that I feel like we need to know before we enter into this season of, of fasting. But before we do that, let's identify the different. When we say fast, what are we referring to? Well, there's, there's the, the absolute fast, which is a tough one. That's the one where we just do um, um, no, no water, no food, nothing. It's the absolute fast, a tough fast. Come on, somebody say, praise God, you're not calling us to that one. <laughs> but then there's, the, then there's the normal fast. And the normal fast is when you abstain from food and you just drink lots of water. And um, come on, somebody say, thank God you're not calling us to that. <laughs> but then there's the partial fast. And that's what we do, do every year. And that, that can be done in a variety of ways. And every year what we do is the Daniel fast. The Daniel fast is where we ask you to do this. We say, hey, no meats, no sweets, no breads for 21 days. So 21-day Daniel fast out of Daniel chapter 10 is where we follow it from. I'm not going to teach that again this year because I've taught it so many years in the past. 
But it's where it, the, the, the Daniel fast comes out of Daniel. When Daniel was pursuing God, he was trying to, he was trying to find God's will, God's plan, trying to get freedom from a spiritual attack that he was under so he could go and fulfill the, the assignment that God had on his life. He was seeking clarity and direction about his life. And he says he goes on this fast for 21 days. No meats, no sweets, and, 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 no, and no breads. And that's what we do. We eat lots of fruit. We eat lots of vegetables. eat lots of nuts. And, and, but listen, here's what you have to understand. You will lose a few pounds. That's a bonus, but that's not a purpose. Because if you, if you go into a fast and you don't pursue, you don't, you don't exercise what we call the principle of replacement, then you're just dieting. It's just a, a bad diet. Because to, to fast in a spiritual way means that you pursue God. It's called the principle of replacement. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pull out these meats and these sweets and these breads and these enjoyable foods, but you're going to replace them with time in God's presence, with time in God's word. The time that you would normally spend preparing and going out and finding these places, you know, that this food that satisfies your flesh. You're replacing that with a pursuit of the presence of God. And and to to just put away meat, sweets, and breads and go through life is not a fast. That's called a diet. And we're not calling you to, some of us could probably use a diet, you know, after the holidays, but that's not what this is. This is a spiritual fast. We're calling the church to to, to do these things. And if you you can't, do you do what you can. I got a call this past week, one of my buddies, he said, Scott, you know what I'm doing this year? He said, I'm calling the church. So just, he said, I'm calling the church to a 12-hour-a-day screen fast. No screens for 12 hours a day. No phones, no computers, no TVs for 12 hours. He said, do you think they'll kill me? I said, you might die. <laughs> but he's calling the church to something that he knows oftentimes interferes with our time with God. Interrupts, disrupts takes from rather than adds to our time with, with, with God. But we do, we do the Daniel fast, and that's what we're, we're asking you to do with us. And I hope by the end of the message today, you'll see the value. If you've never done it before, I hope by the end of today's message, you'll see the value of going on this journey with us and trusting God to do in your life what he's done in so many of our lives over the, over the past year. So today, we're going to talk about fasting. I'm going to give you 10 of them, and I'll go real fast. 10 fasting facts, 10 facts that I think that you need to understand about fasting before you, you fast. Num- number one is this. Fasting is really feasting. Fasting is not about, oh, I'm going to be so hungry, I'm going to starve, I'm going to die. Listen, no, if you fast with us, you will not die. We've not lost anyone yet that I know of, but you will be hungry, but you will not die. So fasting is not about, you know, I don't think I can make it. It's about, it's about sacrifice. It's about humbling. You know what I learned about, about humbling ourselves? Every revival, every move of God throughout time, every move of God, if you track it back through history, track it through the word of God, you know where it started? Every revival started with hunger. Every revival God didn't just move in and say, y'all need a revival. Poof. It was people that were hungry. Every revival through history started with hunger. And spiritually, hunger is so often connected with with physical hunger. See, while the secret of every spiritual revival is hunger, hunger is, is about humility. Hunger creates a humble spirit. It creates a humble heart. And there's no greater path to humility than when we, than we, when we choose to deprive, choose to take from our flesh what our flesh is craving. In Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8, there's a place where God says to Israel, he said, hey, I humbled you. And then he tells them how he humbled them. He said, I humbled you, causing you to, to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your ancestors knew about. And he said, I did this to teach you. God said, I humbled you and fed you what you were not used to eating to teach you that man does not live by bread alone. In other words, God said, listen, I humbled you to teach you that man doesn't live by, by, the, by the, 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 the foods that you're used to eating, by, by, by the, the, the enjoyment of your appetite. I don't, I, I'm humbling you because I want to teach you that you don't need the pizza. You don't need the Krispy Kreme. You don't need your want it, but you don't need it. I'm teaching you. I'm trying to teach you that because it's good to you doesn't mean it's necessarily good for you. 
So God says, I'm going to humble you to teach you that your appetite is off. I want to give you a new appetite. He says, I want to give you a new appetite that, that, that's for me. But he knows food's good. I mean, he gave us food. How many know food is good? Say yes. Yeah. But, 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 but food is, is, not always, is, is not always right for us. He's talking about humbling ourselves before the Lord by allowing ourselves to be a little hungrier than we, than we often are in our, in our flesh. And what he's really saying is because, Scott, here's what I want you to know. What God's really saying through this passage is he says, because you know how when your stomach growls, it tells you I'm hungry. You get aches, pains, because sometimes your body says, I'm hungry, feed me. Come on, anybody ever felt that? Say yes. Because we all know it. And what do we do when our body aches, when our body hungers, when our body growls? What do we do? We feed it, right? Because we know it's it's not as nourished as it needs to be. Here's what God says. In the same way your spirit man... Your spirit man cries out for just in the same way. Your spirit man cries out, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. It growls, feed me, feed me. But what happens, listen, here's what happens. We become so used to, accustomed to, it becomes so common for us to feed our flesh, to feed our carnal man that we don't even hear the growling and the crying out of our spirit man saying, I need to be fed. So God says in this, listen, here's what I want you to understand, that you are not a body. And so many times because we get so used to to satisfying this that you see, satisfy it with the clothes I want to wear, satisfy it with the foods I want to eat, satisfy it with the hairstyle or lack of that I want to put on. And God says, listen, I'm, I'm teaching you to humble yourself to remind you that you are not a body. You're a spirit. Listen, let me remind you, everybody in the room right now, you may see your flesh, but that's not who you are. God says, I'm, I'm going to humble you and teach you that what you think you need is not what you need because I'm going to remind you that you're not a body. You're a spirit. He says, you're a spirit that has a soul and a spirit that lives in a body. But the body's not who you are. The spirit's who you are. But because we get so used to feeding the body that we lose our ability to hear the spirit when it cries out and says, feed me, feed me, feed me. And when we fast, it's retraining our ear to hear from the spirit because we say to the flesh, listen, that's why David said in Psalms 84, he says, my soul yearns for God. Because David understood what God's teaching us through that Deuteronomy passage. Listen, sometimes we can get so accustomed to feeding, you know, the, 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 the signals of our flesh being hungry that we don't even hear the signals of our spirit crying out and saying, feed me, feed me. I'm hungry. I need time and I need more of you. So fasting is really feasting. Feasting on what we need most. Feasting on time with God, feasting on the word of God, feasting on training our our spiritual ears. Number two fact about fasting is is fasting really is results in favor. Because when you humble yourself, we don't fast, listen, we don't fast to earn the favor of God. We fast to humble ourselves before God. And if you ever want to attract God, you attract God with humility. Humility. Humility is what, attracts, is what attracts God. You know that nothing you do impresses God? I, I can't preach a good enough sermon to where, you know, thousands of you leave and say at the end, Scott, that was awesome. Scott, that was awesome. Scott, that was great. And God looks down from heaven and he says, Scott, that was, man, that was something else. That was really good. Never will it happen. I can't impress God. I can't impress God with my actions and my activities, but I can attract God. I can attract God, you know how? Not through my actions, but through my humility. You want to attract God into your life, into your situation? You want to attract God? Don't try to show God how strong you are, how tough you are, how smart you are, how rich you are, how good you are. Don't try to show God what you have, because whatever we have came from him anyway. There's only one way to attract or impress God. You know what it is? Humility. That's it. 
The winds in our life don't attract God. They don't impress God. When we win in life and we say, God, thank you, if it weren't for you, none of it would be possible. That attracts God. Because who, who you've become, what you have, is only possible because of God. And when you acknowledge that fact in your life, you begin to attract him. When we fast, it's humbling ourselves. It's, fasting is like saying, God, there's only one king of this life, and it's Jesus. There's one king of this body, and it's Jesus. It's like they said, King Belly, you are not going to rule my life. King Jesus rules my life. And I'm going to decrease so that you can increase. Yeah. Humility is the thing that attracts God into your life. It attracts the favor of God into your life. And the reason we fast, we fast to attract the favor of God into our lives. Let me give you a third fact that you need to know about fasting. Number three is, is this. It's real, real powerful. Fasting is like a, it's like a wire through which the power of God flows through. See, because there's no power in fasting. There, there's no power in fasting. Power comes through fasting, but there's no power in fasting. Fasting is like that wire that the current of God, the power of God can flow into your life. Power comes from God. Power comes from the Holy Spirit. Power doesn't come from fasting. When we fast, we attract the attention of God. When we fast, it's like throwing a wire from our life all the way up to heaven so that God can push his power down into our lives. Because there's no power. In, lots of people fast. Muslims fast. The Buddhists fast. The Jews still fast. Catholics still fast. Gandhi, Gandhi, a couple of years ago, um, 25 people went on a starvation fast because they wanted to, to change an election. Gandhi fasted 24 re reported times that Gandhi fasted because he, was, he, he wanted to change the political situation of his day. The fitness industry calls us to fast, to do intermittent fasting. There's no power in fasting. But when we, when we engage in a spiritual fast, when we say, God, I'm going to put aside this to pursue you. I'm going to stop doing this to pursue you. I'm going to disconnect with this part of the world so that I can connect with you. I'm going to disconnect with my devices so I can connect with you. I'm going to disconnect with my love for meat, my love for sweets, and my love for bread, and my love for food so that I can connect with you. I'm going to disconnect with what I want so I can connect with what I need. All of a sudden, you create a, a conduit, a wire for the power of God to, to flow into, into your life. That's what, that's what fasting that's what fasting does. When we humble ourselves and we begin to fast and, and, and that power begins to flow in our lives and I've decreased so that he can increase, all of a sudden my heart begins to break in places that it hasn't broken in a long time. Tears begin to flow down my face just because, not because I'm sad, but because the presence of God is overwhelming my life. I begin to see things that aren't pleasing to God that I didn't even recognize were in me, but they're not pleasing God. And I can come to a place of repentance and I can say, God, take this from me so I can be more like you. God, speak to me more because there's things that I need to hear that I've not been hearing. That's what happens when we create a wire for the power of God to, to flood our lives. There's a, there's a fourth thing, though, that happens whenever we fast. It's a fact that we need to recognize, and that is, that is like fasting is, is giving up our physical bowl to receive a spiritual blessing. Fasting says, I'm going to give you my physical bowl so that you can pour into me a spiritual blessing. We, we, we see it all the, way, all the way through Scripture. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Maybe you didn't. Jacob was, um, was the, the, the younger brother and Esau was the oldest. Esau, um, you know, received the commanded blessing from his father, the inheritance. All the wealth of his father belonged to him. Esau was out in the woods hunting for a period of time. He comes in and he's starving to death. He's hungry as he could be. He just wanted food, just wanted to eat. His stomach was growling. He was aching with pain. He felt weak because he was so hungry. And his little brother comes to him and he says, hey, I'll give you my bowl if you'll give me your blessing." 
He said, I give you my bowl of food because that's what your flesh wants. That's what you want right now. But I only give you my bowl if you, if you will, 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 will exchange the blessing of the inheritance, the blessing of the Father. If you'll, if you'll give that to me, then I'll give this to you. And the Bible says that Esau exchanged his spiritual blessing for a bowl. And that's what so many Christians do. We exchange what could be. We exchange the blessings of God for the bowl for the, to satisfy our flesh. We say, God, I, when, when, when we say, God, I don't have time to pray. God, I don't have time to read the Bible. God, I can't find time to go to church. God, I can't t- find time to pursue you. What we're saying to God is, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to my bowl and forego your blessing. The Bible says that Esau, he decided to go with the flesh rather than with the blessing. And he gave his brother Jacob the bowl. And the Bible says that when Esau saw his brother Jacob receiving the blessings of his father's wealth and his father's inheritance, and Jacob remembered that he had exchanged all of that for a bowl of food, the Bible says he mourned and he wept because he chose the wrong thing. See, my prayer is that during this season of fasting that we would remember that the fact about fasting is that fasting is really exchanging our bowl for his blessing. And there's something about prioritizing the blessing of the Lord in our lives. Let me give you a fifth fact about about fasting, and that is this. Fasting is the best way. There's no better way to detox your soul than fasting. Because you know what we do? We, we, comfort, we, we comfort troubled souls with food. You, you, how many have heard comfort food? Come on, you've heard the phrase comfort food. You know where it comes from? Because you know what we do in the natural? When we have a bad day, we go eat. When we have a bad fight, we go eat. When we have a bad moment, when things are disappointing, when we're sad, when we're bored, what do we do? We go and eat. And we call it comfort food. We use food, we use food to comfort those things that need to be detoxed. We, we, fasting teaches us to take to the Father rather than taking to the fridge. Fasting teaches us when I've got this stuff inside of me that just needs to be detoxed. I need to take this hurt to the Lord. I need to take this, this, this bad relationship to the Lord. I need to take this bitterness to the Lord. I need to take this boredom, this disappointment. I need to take it to the Lord. But instead, so many times, you know what we do? We go to the refrigerator, we pull out a steak. And you know what I've noticed? That whenever, if you ever need to be comforted by food, how many know we don't pull out a carrot? You know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe carrot cake, but not a carrot. You know what I mean? I mean, if we're, we're seeking to be comforted, how many know we're going for the good stuff? And fasting, watch, fasting disciplines our heart. It trains us to go to the Father, go to the Son, go to the Holy Spirit with the things that need to be detoxed in our souls, detoxed in our mind, rather than going to the fridge. Fasting trains us. It it trains us to go to the right places to deal with the troubled moments of our lives. Fasting trains us that we don't That we don't self-medicate with food what needs to be taken to the Father. And so many times what we do naturally is because we're so, we're so conditioned to feed the flesh. When we're hungry, what do we do? Eat. We're so conditioned to satisfy the flesh that so many times we don't even hear the cravings of the Spirit. And God wants us to understand that in the same way, listen, in the same way that we get used to listening to this shell that our spirit lives in, that screams at us, feed me, feed me, I'm hungry. The spirit who we really are often cries out, feed me, feed me, I'm I'm hungry. But we can't even hear the voice of the spirit because we've become so conditioned to hearing the noise of the flesh. And when we, when we fast, we're retraining ourselves to go to the Father rather than the fridge. We, we're saying, God, I'm not going to trade the bowl for your blessing. I'm going to humble myself to attract the provision and the blessing of God 
I'm going to remember that fasting is really feasting. Feasting on the things that are right. Feasting on the things that are pure. Feasting on the things that are best for me. Number six, six fact about fasting that you need to know. is Fasting is, is really demonstrating a, um, a crucified life instead of living a carnal life. And when I say carnal, I'm not talking about like, um, oh, you shameful, bad, sinful, carnal person. I'm not talking about like sinful things in our carnal life. I'm just talking about, hey, I'm just carnal. When I'm hungry, I eat. I'm just carnal. When, you know, whenever I drive to work, I listen to what I want to listen to. When I'm done with work, I, we go do what we, wanna, what we wanna do, what we enjoy. That's just the carnal side of us. But when we set aside a season to fast and say, I'm putting aside all of that, no more business as usual, no more life as normal, but you know what? I'm gonna spend this season demonstrating a crucified life. Why is that important for a follower of Jesus? Because, because the Bible says in Matthew chapter six, Jesus, he says this, he, he said, I urge you, he said, I urge, Jesus said this, I urge you. In other words, this is really important. Lean in. It's like he's grabbing us by the face and saying, listen to me. Listen to me. This is important to you. And he says, I urge you. He says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. He said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, there's going to be seasons where you have to put aside what you want, put aside what you desire. And when we fast, when we go into this season, it's a, it, it just, it's a, it's a picture of us saying, you know what, I, I am crucified with Christ. I'm going to demonstrate my ability to deny myself to draw closer to him. Uh, if, if he has the courage to go to a cross, to endure the beating that he endured, to endure the rejection of his friends and of his family, to endure the betrayal of people that were close to him, if he has the resolve to do that for me, I can take these 21 days and live an example of a crucified life. That's what he says. Says the example of the crucified life says, King Belly, you don't rule my life. King Jesus does. That's the example of a crucified life. He says, he, did you know that, that, that nowhere in this book does it command you to fast? You don't have to do this. There, there is no command to fast. God won't love you any more because you fast and he won't love you any less because you don't. There is no command. So you say, Scott, why would I do it then? Because there are loads of commanded blessings for those who do fast. There's no command that you have to. But there's so many promised blessings for those who will do. And he said, it's, a, it's an example of, like, I'm going to live this, this crucified, crucified life. He says, when you fast. He doesn't tell you you have to. He doesn't tell you how you have to fast. But here's what I know. Jesus invited us into discipleship, right? How many know that? Jesus invited you into discipleship. And how many know part of discipleship is discipline? You can't be a disciple if you can't be disciplined. Because discipline is a part of discipleship. And one of the most difficult areas for us to discipline ourselves is with our money and with our food. So Jesus follows us into, invites us into this path of discipleship. And he said, but as you become my disciple, you're going to have to take the path of discipline. Anybody besides me have a hard time disciplining yourself with food? Anybody have a hard time with lying <laughs> in church? Discipline is, discipline is a part of discipleship. And he says, follow, follow me in, in, this, in this way. Let me, give you, let me give you a seventh one. And that is, and that is this. Um, fasting is, is our humble humble response to the grace of God in our life, fasting is not an attempt to earn God's grace. 
Fasting is, is our response to God's grace and mercy and love in our life. It, it is not an attempt for us to earn more of the grace and more of the favor of God. Listen, God doesn't love you any more or any less because you fast or you don't fast. If you have to eat a cracker in the middle of your fast, he's not going to love you worse. If you go 12 days and say, I can't take it anymore, and you jump off the wagon and you go right back into your full-on normal diet, God's not going to love you any more or any less. It's not an attempt to earn the favor and the grace and the mercy of God. There is no curse on those who do not fast. In fact, in the Bible, one place, King Saul, it says he cursed his people who wouldn't. Here's what the Bible says. He says, King Saul said, anybody who does not fast will be cursed. Well, that's King Saul, and he said that just before he was cursed. That's not God. That, that's legalism. That's not God. But the Bible does say while there's no curse that comes upon those who don't fast, there is a commanded blessing that comes upon those who do. So we don't fast because we have to. We fast because we choose to. Because we want to chase down, pursue. We want to attract and invite the blessings of God into our life. I told the first service, I saw it like this this past week, and that is this fasting does not Im improve your worth to God but it does improve your weight. Not your physical weight, but your spiritual weight. Fasting, you'll never be worth more to God than you are right now. You don't earn your worth in the eyes of God because of your spiritual behaviors, because of your spiritual disciplines. You, you can't change your worth before God, but when you fast, you change your weight. When you fast, you go from a lightweight to a middleweight to a heavyweight. When you, when you fast, all of a sudden you move up a level in the arena of the spiritual battles you fight. What those battles, those, those lightweight battles that used to take you out, all of a sudden now you take them out. Whenever you move up into a middleweight, all of a sudden the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You move up into heavyweight status and all of a sudden you, you, you're, just, you're, you're this, 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 this person that can take on the enemy and the onslaughts that he brings against you. People can keep people can persecute you. People can say things that aren't helpful, but they're hurtful to you and you can turn the other cheek. You know why? Not because you're good, not because you're passive, not because you're passive aggressive, not because you really don't care. You know why? But because you're more like Jesus. So you, you, you can fast and it'll never change your worth. But listen, when you fast, it'll change your weight. You'll be able to take on battles, go through, overcome battles that you couldn't overcome before because it will always make you stronger spiritually. Number eight, another fact you need to know about fasting, and that is this. Fasting, fasting is, is the key to which God's power flows. Fasting is, is the key for like fresh power. Anybody want God to do more in 24? Come on, say yes. yes. You want God to do something fresh in this new year? Listen, there's nothing you can do like fasting to, to, to welcome in, to usher in, to, to recognize God. This is the key and I'm turning the key to usher in a brand new power of God in your, in your life. As I told you before, every, every major move of God, God through history has been marked through, through, through hunger. And um, we humble ourselves before the Lord by allowing ourselves to become spiritually hungry to the things that our flesh desires and our flesh craves. And when we fast, we, it's like we take the key and we we turn the key that opens the door to fresh provision and fresh power and fresh blessing that comes, that comes from, from the Lord. I heard somebody say it like this one time, if, if you want to last the fire, if you want to survive the fire, if you want to get through the fire, then fast. You, you survive the fires of life by exercising the power that comes through fasting in life. Because fasting will bring you power that you will not receive. Listen, there's something that happens when I decrease, 
so that he can increase. Do you know where he increases? In here. When I get smaller, he gets larger. When I decrease, he increases. Listen, the more of him I have in me, the greater the fires I can withstand. The bigger the fire, the more Jesus you need. The bigger the battle, the more Jesus you need. The bigger the attack, the more Jesus that you need. We attract the power of God when we exercise the key of fasting in our life. Nothing attracts the power of God like, like fasting. Let me, give you, let me give you another one. Let me, um, anybody believe in God for more power in your life this year? Anybody, just come on, just be honest with me. Forget about who's around you. And, and if you believe in God, you need more power over, your, over self-discipline, power over temptation, maybe power over your temper. Maybe it's tower, power over unhealthy thoughts that you have. Unhealthy anxiety that, that rules your life. Unhealthy fear that doesn't help you, but it hurts you. Come on, anybody believing for more power in your life over that? You know what the Bible says? Listen, the Bible says in, in, in Chronicles, it says, if you and I, it says, if God's, if my people, he said, if, if my people will humble themselves and pray. My, he said, my people. He didn't, say, he didn't say the president. He didn't say the governor. He didn't say the mayor. He didn't say some judicial branch. He didn't say the courthouse. He didn't say the White House. He didn't say if politicians would humble. He said, if my people, not all people, but just my people. Did you know there will be over a million people that are joining us in this fast over these next 20 days? Over a million people will be joining together, and God promises. And he says, listen, if my people, not, not, not the president, not the king, not the police, not the governor, not the mayor, not the White House, not the courthouse, but if my people, that's you and that's me, if we would humble ourselves... We'd pray, we'd turn for, from our wicked ways. What is that? Does that mean all the sinful activity in our life? No, that's not really what that means. But if we'll turn from our wicked ways, what is that? Putting God's will, over, our will over God's will. Not being able to deny ourselves to follow him. Picking what we want over what he wants. Satisfying our fleshly needs rather than our spiritual needs. He says if we'll just, if we'll just call on him, turn from those wicked ways. You know what he says? He says that he will heal our land. Not just that, not just your family, not just your, you know, your, your relationship, not just your, fam your finances, but he says, I'll give you the influence as the body of, as my people, I'll give my people the influence they need to bring healing to their world. And listen, I'm not going to get on this all right now, but listen, there's a culture going on in America right now that is destroying our country. It's wrecking our country, destroying, completely tearing apart the fabric of our country. We need a revival in America. We need a revival in our churches. We need a revival in our streets. Listen, you need a revival in your home. And if you're not thinking about it right now, man, you need the revival the most. We need a revival. And the Bible says, if my people, that's us, that's you, that's me. If we'd humble ourselves, we'd pray. God says, here's what I promise you I'll do. I'll send power. I'll send power that gives you the influence to save your land. To save your land. It's a promise from God. Let me give you, let me give you two more and then I'm done. Fasting does this. It's not just for crisis, but it's for your calling. In the Old Testament, whenever you read about fasting, they almost always fasted because there was a crisis, because there was, there was bad things going on. I mean, they really needed a miracle. They need God, help us out of the crisis. So in the Old Testament, the fasting was for Christ. But when you look in the New Testament, most times fasting was not about crisis. It was about calling. It was about purpose. So I want you to know that, that your, your, your fast during this season of fasting, it's not just because there's crisis in your life. It's because you have purpose in your life. Because you have a purpose, you have a calling, you have, you have something that, that you, 
that you have been created to do. And it's powerful. And when you fast, you begin to, to put on ears that can, that can hear what God is saying to you. When you think about people in the, in the Bible, you think about Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He went out to the wilderness. Remember that? 40 days, 40 nights. Remember that Jesus went? Come on. We're not doing 40 days and 40 nights, y'all. Somebody say amen. amen. 21 days, half what Jesus did. And Jesus did it without anything. But you know what, he, what happened in his life? He came back. He came back with clarity about his purpose. Jesus went and fasted for the courage and the strength and the power to do what he had been put on the planet to do. Jesus went and fasted for 40 days to have the courage to fulfill his calling. Jesus did that. You look on through the Bible, you look at Anna. She goes to the, to the temple and, and, and she prays for her calling. Cornelius is another one. You can read his story in Acts chapter 10. He didn't, he didn't fast because he was broke, because he was sick, because his family was in crisis. You know why he fasted? He fasted because he wanted to get closer to God and because he knew he had a purpose on his life, but he couldn't figure out what is it. You know what it was? Because he fasted, you and I are here today, because Cornelius, during his fast, God gave him a vision. God gave him a word. God gave him direction. He became the one who really opened up the gospel to the known world. We're here. We have the gospel today because Cornelius said, wait, during my fast, God showed me that this gospel is too great, too good. It's too big for just this one nation, Israel. It's for the whole world. Let's write. Let's go. Let's evangelize. Let's preach to all nations. Listen, you and I are here. Listen, you and I are here today because during a fast, Cornelius found his purpose. Because Cornelius found out that fasting is not just about crisis, it's about purpose. It was during a fast that Paul and Barnabas received their purpose to, to write the rest of the New Testament, the, the epistles. It was during that, in fact, Jesus said this, they were, they were fasting and God said this, he said, let us bring Paul and Barnabas into the mission for which I have called them. You're in a fast. Because fasting isn't just for crisis, it's for your calling. During their fast, God said, let us bring them into the mission, the purpose for which I have called them. They begin to write the, the rest of the New Testament. Church planting began to happen all over the known world because during a fast God identified the, the purpose of those who are pursuing him and, and you're like Scott well I mean I just I want to have this normal comfortable Christian life that's what I that's all I ask for I just want to be normal and I just want to be comfortable and I just want this average Christian life why would I fast listen because you've got way too much potential to settle for normal because there's too much purpose in your life to settle for normal because God created you for too much to settle for normal. I'm not talking about, you know, tomorrow you're going to get up and, and, and go to work to do what you do. I'm talking about getting up and going to do what you were born to do. I'm talking about more than just getting up and going, you know, to the job that, that you're going to get paid for. I want to know what is it that you were created for? What were you saved for? Because here's what I know. You were... You were you were saved for more than just to occupy seats in a church. You were saved for more than to just go to heaven. Well, how do you, how do you know that, Scott? Because the Bible's clear. It says you were saved by grace for good works. What works? Good works. He says, which I planned in advance for you to do. In other words, he says, when I formed you in your mama's womb, I had these good works set aside just for you. But you can't do them because I created you. You can't do them until you give me the opportunity to save you. See, fasting is more than it's about your purpose. And I just believe God's looking for people who will say, you know what, God, I'm getting up tomorrow and I'm going to go do, you know, what I get paid to do. But what I really want to do is what I've been created to do. What I'm really looking for is what I've been saved to do. What I've been really looking for is that purpose in my life that nobody else can do but me. 
And I'm telling you, when you fast, God will bring clarity. He did it for Paul. He did it for Barnabas. He said, while they fasted, God said, let us fulfill the mission for which we have called them. If he'll do it for them, why won't he do it for you? Fasting is bigger than crisis. It's about your calling. Not what you do, but what are you born to do? What are you, what are you saved to do? What are you created to do? I'm just, I'm just believing that during this fast, some of you are going to see so clearly, like Paul and Barnabas, the purpose for which you were called. Because that's what fasting can do. Tenth thing, fact, you need to know about fasting is fasting is really preparation for temptation. Fasting, fasting prepares you to, to, to overcome the, the temptations that, that come in, into your life. When you're, when you're fasting this week, you're going to be tempted with some food that, that you're abstaining from. When you're, when you're fasting in week two, you're going to be tempted to, 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 to partake in some food that you said, no, I'm withstanding from. Why? Because it's bad? Why? Because No, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to abstain from this and replace it with this. Because I'm disciplining myself to remind my life that, that there's only one king of this soul, and it's Jesus. It's not Burger King. It's Christ the King. And he says, he says, you, you'll be better equipped. You remember Jesus? Jesus came out of the wilderness out of the time of fasting. And what did he do? He overcame temptation. You remember that? How did Jesus overcome temptation? By going back into fasting. What's that have to do with me? Or it has a lot to do with all of us. Because for most of us, we've got things in our lives that we're trying to get past. Come on, anybody hate temptation besides me? Come on, anybody's just tired of dealing with temptation? Well, you know when temptation's going to leave? When you die. As long as you live, you're going to be tempted. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to be tempted. But you know what fasting does? It gives me power over temptation. It doesn't take temptation from me, but it gives me power to withstand from temptation. And if you're here and you would say, you know, God, you know about these, these issues that I deal with, these habits that, that, I, that I can't seem to break. God, you know better than anybody about this lust issue going on in my life. You know the bitterness that I live with. You know that, that, that I, I want you to bless me, but God, I've not had the courage to yet forgive them. And God's like, listen, you're blocking your own blessing because you refuse to forgive. God can't bless you as long as you're cursing them. And you're tempted to hold on to the offense. You're tempted to hold on to the hurt, to hold on to the pain. And some of you during this season, you need, you need to allow the, the power of God during this fast to give you the power to overcome your temptation. I don't know what you're tempted with, but God knows and the Bible teaches us that when you fast, it gives you power to overcome temptation. What temptation? Whatever temptation the enemy throws at you. I'm not, I'm not telling you you won't be tempted again because you fasted, because you will. As long as you're alive and there's a devil, there's going to be temptation. You'll never get so saved that you won't be tempted. You'll never go to church so much, pray so loud, give so much, never. And to you, you can't outrun temptation. There's only one way to stop being tempted, and that is to die. And how many know that's not a good option? So in this world, when we're going to face temptation, a better option is to figure out how do we beat temptation. And the Bible says when we fast, it gives us power to overcome temptation that comes into our lives. I'm not telling you that that 
you know, during this 21 day fast, you'll be completely set free of some addiction or whatever it is you have. But I can promise you this. I can promise you if you'll fast and you'll take your fast serious. Come on. How many want to see God do great things on this fast? Say yes. Can I tell you that the measure, the measure of the great things God does during this fast will be the measure of how serious we take this fast. God will take this fast in our lives as serious as we take this fast in our lives. I'm telling you, you do it and God will set you up for freedom. You will not have faced your last temptation, but I'll tell you what, you will be empowered to overcome your next one. You may not be set completely of whatever it is that has come on you, but I promise you this, when you fast and you pray, you have opened yourself up for others to pray with you, join with you, pray the prayer of freedom, pray the prayer of deliverance, whatever it is you need over your life. You've set, you've positioned yourself for victory. There's so many promises that come with fasting. And I'm just believing that this year we're going to step in to the promises of God as we prioritize God at the beginning of this year. You believe it? Come on, if you believe it, stand up on your feet, will you? Come on, give God praise. Thank Him for His Word, will you? Come on, just thank God for His Word that never, ever changes. It's always to say, come on, thank God for His Word, will you? Just, just thank Him. God, thank You for feeding us, for giving us Your Word. For God, thank You for speaking to us about the power we have over this world, over this life. We're going to sing, but here's what I felt like. Here's what I felt like at the end of our first service that I needed to do today, and I'm going to do it in this service as well. I want, to, I want to pray with you. Some of you, I want you to, I want you to enter into a new season of growth spiritually. As I pray for you, moving into this, this new year, we roll out our word for the year next year. I'm just praying that God will, God will bring freedom and growth into your lives like He never has before. In fact, we're, we're starting next Sunday. There's a new, there's a brand new um, group or class that's starting. It's going to meet every Sunday at 1045. It's called Next Steps. You know, here at Cornerstone, we say we want you to do three or four things. Number one, we want everybody to go through growth track. That's where you learn about the church. Find out who we are, what we're about. You see all these folks praying for people in the altars. That's where we find out your spiritual gifts. You often wonder, man, I wonder who who the people are that pray in the altars for people. You know who they are? They're people who have exercised and let us know through growth track that they have the gift of faith, that they have the gift of prayer that God has given them. That's their, your path to joining that team, growth track. It tells you more about the church and more about you. And then we say we want everybody to go through freedom. Freedom groups are just groups that help us unlock all those things that have the potential to hold us back from all the promises that God wants to give us. And then we say we want everybody to join a group because we just believe that life is, it happens better in groups than it does in isolation. So we want everybody in a group. But we're starting this year with our new First Step programs. And, um, you know, typically we think First Steps, when you give your life to Christ, you need your first step in Christ. But here's what we found. There's a lot of people who've been serving Jesus for, you know, for 20 years, but they haven't really grown past that first week or month or year in relationship with Jesus. It's like I see a lot of marriages and, and they... They, they've been married for 40 years, but they really haven't grown any closer. Their love hasn't gotten any better. They're not any kinder to each other because they haven't grown more than they did that first year. It's because they didn't prioritize it. So you know what we're doing? We're starting this class. You can start next week, 1045, every Sunday. It doesn't build. There's no entry point or exit point. You just go. You don't miss anything if you start in week seven or if you start in week one. And we're just going to ask everybody to grow. If you give your life to Christ, we want you to go through that class so that you can grow and become strong. If you've never gone through a growth season of your life, we want you to know that that's there for you to go and you can grow in your relationship with, with Jesus because it matters to us and it matters to Him. But we're moving into a new year. And I just felt like there's people that will come to church on this last Sunday of 2023 and they'll be carrying stuff that they don't want to carry into the new year. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's old habits. Carrying past pains. And I just felt like the Lord wanted to give you an opportunity to let go 
of that stuff. Leave it. Leave it here. Just declare you're, you're not going with me into this new year. I'm not allowing you to go. Unforgiveness, you're staying. Bitterness, you're staying. Lust, you're staying. Anger, you're staying. Bad attitudes, bad relationships, you're staying. You're not going with me into this new season. Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do. And then there's others that are here. You've heard the message today. You've heard the music today. And maybe the Holy Spirit was tapping on your heart saying, you know what? This all sounds good, but you don't even have a relationship with Jesus. You've, you've never invited him into your life to be your Savior and your Lord. And today, today you would just say, you know what, Scott? I don't want to leave 2023 without knowing Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't want to move into 2024 without knowing Jesus as my Lord. Because I believe that life with better is a life with Jesus. It really is better than life without Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. Pastor Ash and the team's going to sing. And when they do, if, if you're here, you would say, Scott, I just, I'm not where I, I need to be with Jesus. And I want to give him my life. I want to give him my life. Maybe you've drifted away and you're, your message is, I need to give him my life back. I need to give my life back to him. Maybe you're here and you would say, Scott, there's stuff that I've carried through 2023 that's hurt me, it's limited me, it's isolated me, it's kept me in a, a self-built prison. And I don't want to go into a new year that way. I want to leave it. I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you as we sing to get out of your seat. And I want you to bring it to this altar. And some of the altar team is going to come. Me and Elizabeth are going to come. We're going to pray for you. Because I want you to leave it here. If you are here, you need to invite Jesus into your life. We're going to pray that prayer. But if that's you, you know who you are. I want you to boldly, boldly declare. You don't have to take stuff into this new season that you don't want to take. You can leave it. You can leave it at the altar. He says, old things pass away and all things become new. You throw them all into the sea of forgetfulness and the only way that you get it back is if you go swimming and you dig it back out. But you can leave it here. Some of you need to. I just wanted to give you that opportunity if that's you as we sing. Just get out of your seat and come. If you need Jesus or if you've got stuff you just need to leave in the altar, just come. This is your time. Don't wait, You're don't look around, just come. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. Team, if you haven't already come, to very come to come quickly and just stand behind behind these that are in the wall, altar right now. Come on, everybody on our prayer team, on our board, just come and build a wall. Build a wall behind these that are here. Things that they want to bury, things that they want to leave behind, things that they don't want to carry into the new season. Can I just ask you to boldly, to boldly right now, just in your own way, out of your own voice, from your own heart, just begin to to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm leaving this at your feet. Here's what the Bible says. 
He says, come and, and let me prove how much I care for you. He said, if you'll lay your burdens at my feet, he says, my yoke is easy. He says, my burden is light. He says, if you'll lay it at my feet, if you'll lay it at my feet, you don't have to pick it back up. You can leave it there. Just, just leave it there. Leave the burden, leave the hurt, leave the pain, leave the confusion, leave those things that have kept you back rather than pushed you forward. Leave them. Just, just in, in your own way, just, just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm laying this. Call it out by name. Whatever it is, just call it out. If it's bad relationships, if it's hurt for relationship, if it's unforgiveness, if it's, if it's an addiction or if it's a temptation, just, just call it out. Say, Lord, I'm laying it down. I'm laying it on the altar. Come on, just as an act, as a physical act, as a visible act, lay it, lay it at the altar. Lord, we lay these things down at your feet. Lord, you know the things that have restricted us, that have held us back, that have kept us back. Lord, we lay these addictions, we lay these pains, we lay these hurtful feelings, hurtful emotions. God, we lay them at your feet right now. Lord, we don't want to carry them into a new season. We want to move into 2023 light. Lord, we want to move in mobile. We want to move in able to hear your voice clearly and act immediately. Lord, we want to be more sensitive than we ever have been before. We don't want distractions. We don't want our vision to be blurred. We don't want our hearing to be blocked. We don't want our hearts to be hardened, God. But we want to be soft and pliable and sensitive to you, Lord. So we lay these things at your feet. We lay these burdens down right now. We lay these things before you and ask you to take them. Give us courage not to pick them back up again. Give us courage to not try to walk them out again, but to allow you to work them out for us. Lord, we lay them at your feet. We give you these things now. We say thank you for promising to carry our burdens for us. Thanking you for promising to make our yokes light. And Lord, right now we ask we ask you to cover us with strength and cover us with boldness and give us the power. Give us the power to walk away, to leave it, to leave it here, to leave it behind, to leave it in 2023. And it has no place in our lives in this new year. It can't go with us. God, heal the things as we walk in freedom. Lord, as we walk out in freedom, we pray that you would begin to work on the hearts and the minds of those who are not with us today. Anything that we lay down that involves other people, God, we pray that as we leave it, you would begin working on it in the lives of everyone else who is involved. Lord, we trust you with this. We trust you today with this, and we thank you for your promise. In Jesus' name, we will pursue you. We will pursue your presence. We will pursue our walk with you. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Yes. Jesus in the Now you lift your hands and begin thanking him for Jesus victory, will you? Come on, if you're so left here, just raise your hands and begin to thank him for it. But thank Jesus him for victory. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus.
came to the altar today because of your relationship with Jesus may not be in the right place, may not even be existent. But we're going to pray with you right now if you're here. Everybody in the room, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. Those of you that are here in the altar, if you're here to give your life to Jesus, just, just pray with the rest of us. And here's what I want you to know. I don't know when the last time somebody threw a party for you was. But the Bible says every time one person comes home, when one sinner comes home, when one life comes back to Jesus, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party on your behalf. So at the end of this prayer, we're going to lift our voices. We're going to clap our hands. We're going to shout with all the angels in heaven because of what God's doing in your heart right now. Come on, everybody ready to pray? Say it out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace that covers my life, that covers my sin, that covers all of my failures. Thank you for your promise to forgive me when I ask. When I confess that you are Lord, that you died on a cross, that you rose from the dead so that I could have life. Lord, I receive that gift. I accept you into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Empower me by the Holy Spirit and I will live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord now, will you? Hey, Wednesday night, we'll be right back in this room. First Wednesday, every Wednesday night this month, we'll have church. We're going we're gonna to be praying. We're going to be praying through this fast this Wednesday. Listen, if you start your fast by Wednesday, first three days are the toughest. You might have a headache. Your breath might stink a little bit. You might feel a little bit tired. But listen, you get to church anyway. Don't let the devil keep you out of where you need to be when you're fasting for the Lord. Amen. You're going to need a good pep talk. You're going to need to get fired up. And that's what we're going to do on Wednesday night. Amen. Hey, I love you. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome week. If you prayed that prayer of salvation, please fill out one of our cards. Take it to the I Decided table. And we'll see you next Sunday morning back in church. Bless you guys.